possible. So today, today I'm bringing a message on. Go in here. There we go. Today I'm bringing a message on uh, why why does bad things happen to good people? Why do right? And uh, and you may not like the answer. I have appointed Brian the catcher. So if you have any rotten fruit in your purse or your bag, your pockets, whatever, he'll catch it on his way to me. <laughs> and so saying that, what I'm saying to you is uh, reserve judgment for what you're hearing until the end of the message. It's important. Uh, you can't just pick up on one little thing that I say and try to make, right? Wait to the end of the message. It, it will all come together. It will all come together. And, and it will make sense. And everything I say to you about this is from Scripture. So it's, it's not my wild imagination. It's, it's, it's from, the, it's from the, the, the Word of God. And, uh, but sometimes we forget about these things and we like to forget about them. And uh, so that's, that's about it. So we will have communion on... Uh, on the 20th, I hope, on Sunday, with up here, coming forward again. It's been two years, right? It's been nice, so we'll do that. And uh, there's not a lot of other announcements going on other than we may or may not be done with the masks on the 14th. Hospital stays are starting to increase a little bit, so we don't know what's going to happen when we get, yeah, just a little bit. But, so we'll see what happens when we, uh, when we get there. That's about that, and I am, uh, I put in the bulletin there that Reverend John Fournier will come in and bring the message on the 26th or something, or 27th, somewhere in there. I'll be in the Ontario area, area, visiting my mother, and there's already a list of things I have to bake or cook. So, they're sending me ahead of time, two weeks ahead of time. Here, you got to buy any ingredients or put in your luggage, bring it. I am going to endeavor to bring back the uh, didgeridoo, so we can use it. Hey, if you can sing Amazing Grace to the tune of the animal's House of the Rising Sun, <laughs> imagine what you can do with the didgeridoo, right? Maybe later on in the year we'll even get the band together again, and, uh, and that'll be fine. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today, and uh, I thank you for those who have come here today. I ask a blessing upon each and every one of their lives. I pray for those who couldn't be here today for various reasons, sicknesses, or the weather, or fear, or uh, so many other things, Lord. Father, we want to glorify you with all that we say, and all we do, what we think, and how we act, and how we react. And Lord, I know that you are here, but you are welcome in this place. Father, give us all a clear path to listen to your word today. It's maybe some difficult talk, but something that needs to be said. And Father, as we get to our time of, our formal time of prayer, we will be lifting up uh, Ukraine, and we will be lifting up uh, Putin as well. And uh, so Lord, it could be a difficult Sunday for us, and for those watching, uh, but I just ask, Lord, that your spirit guide us in all these things. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. And you will read, and let me just read that right off the bat here, from Matthew 5, 43 to 44, and I put it in your bulletin. So you have heard that it is said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And so we will be praying for Putin today. That... Uh, among other things, and people might say that we don't want to do that, but, but, uh, but that's what we're going to do. And uh, so, let's start. I'll fly away. I love this song. <laughs> and you can, uh, you can stay seated. Once we get clear of the mask, then we'll get up and jump around. If you want to stand up, it's okay. It's completely up to you. Here we go. Some that morning when I had over a Like 
scripture is uh, comes to us from Job and uh, Job chapter one and almost verse uh, verse twenty one. Sorry, Job one verse twenty one. And uh, Job says this. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return. And the Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. One more time. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return. The Lord gave, and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And whatever happens in our life, we need to bless the name of the Lord. The Lord loved us so we could love Him and love each other. I am sinking deep in sin from the peaceful shore. Very deep in sin within, and He arrived no more. But the master of the sea, through my despair and thigh, from the water.
you know, when we're talking about, um, especially talking about why bad things happen to good people, and uh, when we get into it a little later on, um, we always need to be reminded that God loves us, and uh, and that that we are who God says we are. And, you know, we read that in Scripture, right? You know, for those, we need to believe in the Father. And we need to believe the Father will do what, what the Father says He will do. And we also need to believe in who the Father says we are. And so join me in this, will you? Who am I?
prepare your hearts for prayer and perhaps even some difficult prayer. Because it's not just about uh, Putin. Uh, we need to pray for all of our enemies and all those people that cause us grief in life. And I'm sure there's enough of them out there. And that's something that God calls us uh, to do.
that you would do a work in his life, Lord, that he would come to know you, that he would come to see the evil within him, that those around him with any influence at all, if they do, would do something, would stand up, would be men and women of, of, of integrity, make the sacrifice, stop the bloodshed. May your word convict that man, Lord, and change the course of history in that life, in that area. Father, I ask you to be with those today that, that are here and that are not here. They're, they may be suffering physically or mentally or financially or relationally or even spiritually. Lord, possible. And Father, I want you to reach into their lives. I ask you to reach into their lives, Lord. Be with them. You have told us that we're not going to get a free ride in this life, even after we surrender our hearts to you, but that you would walk with us through the valleys and on the mountaintop. And we praise you for that, Lord. We praise you for that. And so, Father, guide us through this message today. And maybe that's a message we can take to those in our communities, in our neighborhoods. Hard messages that we need to hear. Truths that we may not want to hear, but we have to. Things that we need to understand and, and, and put within us, Lord. Help us. Holy Spirit, will you convict each and every one of us with the words found, your words, your inspired words found in Scripture about what we should do and how we should think. Because this is your will for our lives. Thank you, Father, for this and so much more. And I thank you for that little boy in Sri Lanka that you brought out of the hospital. And I pray for that entire family, the extended family, God, that they would come to know your love and beauty. In Jesus' name we pray. Quite a bad things happen to good people. And I'm sure a lot of things have happened to the people you know that you think they're good. Maybe to yourself, you consider yourself good. Let's assume you know someone who's sick, very sick, maybe even mortally sick. They are good. They attended church, they read their Bible, they pray, they do good works, maybe even submissions. And they are suffering, and they may even die. God seems to be distant and not answering your prayers in the way that you want God to answer those prayers. And in that, what are you to think of God? What are you to think of God in your life and the life of a person who may be ill, or in pain, or suffering, or in tribulation? Now, in order to understand this, there's a few things that we need to understand about God first that we have come to know, but we need to cement them in our minds as we move through this message from God. One is that God is all-knowing. That means, that means that God knows you. That means that God knows this person that you're praying for that may be sick, or that may be in the hospital, or may be suffering depression. God knows them. They know what they're going through. They know God knows what they are feeling. God knows what the people around them are feeling and, and the complications of everything that's happening. He knows all of these things. He knows how bad it is for them. God's all powerful. That means that if God chooses to do so, God can change their circumstances. God can reverse what is going on in their lives. And God is all loving. The essence of God is love. He's the ultimate giver. He's the ultimate love. The ultimate lover. The, he's everything. Every choice He makes in this world and for you and for me is done strictly out of love because God is a God of love and He cannot do anything but love 
us. Believe it or not, anyone who may be sick and anyone who might be injured or afflicted in some way, it's not a random thing. We think they just got sick or this happens or that happens. Some people believe that God created us and just like a bowling alley and fired the, the world down the lane and we could do whatever is going to happen, but God is in control. Did you know that in the Hebrew language, there are no words in, in the Hebrew language for random or for chance? There are no words in the Hebrew for chance or for random. God knows everything. It is not a reality with God that things should happen that he does not know about. Not a reality with God. Today, we are in the middle of Lent. In the Baptist tradition, we don't really celebrate Lent. Some churches do, and some don't. It's 40 days of reflection about what's happening at Easter, reflection about your life and about your lifestyles. And some people forego eating things or playing computers or other things for 40 days. And if they forgone something, they should replace that with some time with God to reflect on those things, just not give it up. Has anyone here, ask yourself this question, I don't think it's true, has anyone here in the last 40 days, or is anyone all in a 40 day stretch gone without any trouble? 40 straight days, more than a month, no trouble. Has anyone gone for 40 days without any pain? No pain, no aches. Has anyone gone 40 days without any frustrations? Especially not during this pandemic, have we? God is good. And I would think that if you have gone more than 40 days without any of these things, the love of God is not upon you at all. So does God bring affliction on the good? Because that's the question, is it not? Why do the good, why do bad things happen to good people? Does God bring affliction upon the good? That's a fair question to ask. Did God bring the sickness upon the person we talked about at the beginning of the message? Did he allow it? To happen to that person? The short answer is yes. Yes, he did. And was it good that they were sick or afflicted? And you might answer categorically, absolutely not. How can anything like that be good? How can sickness or pain or frustration or strife or tribulation be good? No would be the answer. What is good? And can anyone be sick beyond good? Many of us have difficulties seeing beyond just a snapshot of life. It's like the keyhole Lois is going to throw up here. If we can peer through this keyhole, we can only see what's in front of us, the past is by us. We can't see what's off to the side, on the top, or on the bottom. We can only see what we're looking at. And we look at our lives that way. We have blinders on, just like a racehorse. We see what's in front of us. We try to look around, but we're concerned about ourselves. We're concerned about those that we love. We see these things. We can't see all the time what's happening all around us. And so when we do that, we think that everything in our lives should be good. And if we wanted to know what everything was like in everyone's life, we would have to go back to the very beginning with God when he created the heavens and the earth. To be able to see life unfold, relationships unfold, circumstances unfold, generations unfold. And unless we're back there and can see that, all we can truly see, for the most part, is as if we are looking through a keyhole. Humans as well tend to decide for themselves what is good. 
is good. What job is good for me? What car is good for me? What spouse or girlfriend or boyfriend is good for me? What kind of toys are good for me? We try to decide these things. Perhaps this, in thinking about this, we should go to Genesis, right back to the beginning, to see what good is, so we can decide for ourselves what is good, so that we know what bad things happen to good people, what the good of those people are. Shouldn't we have an understanding of good first, before we can decide whether bad things should or should not happen to good people? And what we're doing here in Genesis 1, 11, and 12, Lois has it up, is just a snippet. It's one day of creation. It reads this way. Then God said that the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees on the earth bearing fruit, after their kind with seeds in them. And it was so. And the earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed after their kind, and trees bearing fruit with seed in them, and after their kind. And God saw that it was what? That it was good. And in fact, on most of the days of creation, at the end, God looked at what he created, what he developed, what he brought out of nothingness, and declared that it was good. But that's our translation. We have translations, hundreds and hundreds of translations of the original scripture. But there's something called the mechanical translation of the Old Testament. And it is an ancient translation of the original Hebrew symbols and what they mean. And we need to go back to the original, back to the to the word for word symbols, early language to understand truly what God meant by this. Now as I'm reading this, Lois is going to show you a nice lush vegetation because that's what happened on that day. Beautiful. Now listen to these words very carefully because it's going to make a difference to you and it should make a difference as we define good so we can decide what is good or bad and whether good people, bad things should happen to them. This is how it goes. And Elohim, God, said, the land will make grass sprout herbs producing seeds, trees of the produce, making produce to his kind, which is his seed, is in him upon the land, and he existed so. And the land brought out grass, herbs, sowing seed to his kind, and trees making produce, which he has his seed in him to his kind, and Elohim saw that it was functional. Functional. The true definition of good is something like functional, but when we break that word down, it means purposeful. And so when God created all of that, He said all of it is purposeful. It's functional. It can do something. It will end in something. And then when he did the next day with the fish and the animals, he looked at them and said that they are all functional. They are all purposeful to the entire dream of creation. And so when we look at the word good from now on, or for this message, we need to replace the word good, if we can, with functional or purposeful. Purposeful. The true definition of good is purposeful. Sometimes things can be purposeful, but very painful. Work sometimes can be painful. Can it not? You may not like the people you're doing. You may not like the job you're doing, but you have to do it. People may bug you there. There may be danger in what you do, but it is purposeful, good, because you gain a salary or money for that, whereby you can take care of your family or yourself and you can eat, you put a roof over your head. Childbirth, although I've never had to and hope I never will, give birth. They say that kidney stones are almost like giving birth and I've had a lot of kidney stones and I would never, and I've told you before, if men had to give birth, we'd be importing children from Mars. Because we wouldn't do it a second time. Childbirth is purposeful. It's good. 
It leads to you having children that you can grow up with and be around you that might help take care of you, that could be uh, good members of society that will give you comfort and relationships. But childbirth is bloody painful. It is. So childbirth is purposeful, functional, but painful. Chemotherapy can be painful as it seeks to deal with the cancer within your body. And all the treatments are painful. But they are what? They are purposeful. They are good. They are functional even though they're painful. And speeding tickets would be for me as I seek to do the spirit of the law and not the letter of the law as I'm driving down the highways of the land. And if I were to get a speeding ticket, that would hurt. That would be painful. Would it not? But it would be purposeful because it would make me slow down for a little while anyway. But it might stop you from going so fast that you would get into an accident and you could take the life of someone else who's innocent or destroy property with the vehicle. All these things are purposeful, good, but at the same time are painful in a way. Sometimes things that are most painful can be the most purposeful. I want to tell you a true story of a man on a cruise, an old man on a cruise. And this gentleman wanted to be on a cruise all his life. He worked and worked and worked, and he knew that when he retired, that he was going to go on a cruise, and he was going to lie on the deck and be gently rocked by the ship, and look at the sunsets and the sunrises, and lie in the sun in those little, like, you know, the lay-down chairs, and have a little drink with those umbrellas in it. They make the mocktails too, right? Without the alcohol in it. And so when he retired, that's what he did. He booked a 10-day cruise. 10 days. On the first day, he got up. Beautiful sunrise on the horizon. He sat down in one of them fancy chairs. The sun started to beam on him. He was good. He was reading a bit of a book. He had one of those drinks with the little umbrellas in it. Life was good. The second day, day two, he gets up. He just sits down, a toddler comes screaming down the deck, mom chasing, trips and slides headfirst underneath the bottom of the guardrail and goes over the side. He didn't even think about it. He got up and he jumped over the side. Getting to the child was hard and he was swallowing lots of salt water and a lot of salt water was going into his lungs as he tried to breathe and that's extremely painful. And then when he got to the child, the child just was panicking and wanted to get up the side of the ship and was scratching and gouging at his face and he was bleeding. And finally he got control of the child and they got a rope over there with a, with a, 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 a kisby ring on it, they call it, and they hauled him and the child up. And he went straight down to sick bay or the infirmary because his pains were just burning with pain, his lungs, from the salt water he inhaled. And the stitches from the from his face, from where this child would panic. And he didn't blame the child for any of this stuff. Day two, he spent in the infirmary, not on the deck, not in the sun, not with a gentle rocking, not with a little drink with the umbrella in it. Day three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, he spent in the infirmary. And then probably went to the hospital after that. Everything he planned for all his life, Everything he'd saved for all his life, gone on the morning of day two. Someone asked him sometime later, what was the most memorable moment of your life? What was the most memorable thing that happened in all of your life? And he said, the little boy I saved on the cruise ship that day. And even though I had the scars from that, and even though I missed the whole cruise, even though I'd saved up for it, I've never been on another cruise because I can't afford it, that has been the most memorable day. I was in pain that day. My face was bleeding in pain. My lungs burned with the salt water that got in there. It was a painful, horrible experience. But a young boy would have a chance to grow up and have a family and have a life. And so even in the pain that I remember, that is the best day of my life. The challenge of life is to come to an understanding that 
We don't see the big picture. And sometimes we must come to an understanding that there's more to pain than we can see or understand or hope for. Even for the good, the purposefulness, the functionalness. I want to tell you one more true story. The year was, uh, I think it was 1913. Yeah, I believe it was 1912, 1913. And this was a Jewish man. And, uh, and he was in the middle of Europe, towards Asia. And already, even before the First World War, there was a lot of the Jews had been attacked and, and bothered on and, and oppressed for years. And he wanted to take his family to America. He wanted so bad to get away from this and start a fresh life, a new life with new people. He sold everything he had. Everything he had, he sold. His house, the possessions inside the house, his work, his tools, everything. He sold everything and bought two train tickets and two boat tickets. So he could take his wife and his children to a new land and a new start. The first train ticket was from where he was to Paris. The second was from Paris to the coast or and then from the coast, a ferry over to England, and from England, a ship over to the United States. The train from his town left at 9 o'clock every day. You could set your clock by the train. That, could, that, that engineer was at 9 o'clock. If you were not on the train, the train was going without a ship. 9 o'clock every day. And he decided, I don't want to miss the train with my family. I'm going to get there at 8.30, have lots of time to get on the train and get settled in. He arrived about 20 after 8 or so to the platform and he saw black smoke on the horizon from the steam locomotive. The train had already gone. He said to the station master, what's going on? Why is the train gone? Why is it not here? It's only 8.30. It's not 9 o'clock. It's not supposed to leave tonight. And the station manager says, I don't know. It always leaves at 9. Every day. I work here for years. 9 o'clock every day the train leaves. But somehow it left early. I was in my office and all of a sudden I heard a horn and I looked up at 8.20 8 or so and the train is going off. He said, I have no idea and I couldn't stop. He was devastated. He went back to the village where he was with his wife and his family, tried to live with other family members, tried to scourge up what he could, went to the synagogue, woe is me, into the temple. Life was bad. Everyone knew he'd spent all his money. Everyone knew he was now destitute and homeless. Two weeks later, he comes into, true story, two weeks later, he comes into the synagogue, Praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. That's all they could do. Praise God. They thought he was crazy. What are you praising God for? You lost all your possessions. You lost your home. You lost your business. You lost everything. You're praising God? He said, yes. I just looked at the newspaper this morning. And the ship that I was supposed to be on hit an iceberg and sunk. Why did the train leave early that day? The station master did. He didn't know why at all. Sometimes we need to wait to see what the good is in a situation. Sometimes we have to wait days or weeks or months or even years to see what the purposefulness, the functionalness, the good is in the pain and in the frustration and in the agony. Habakkuk, chapter 1 and verse 9. All them come for violence. Their hordes and faces move forward, and they collect captives like sand, he says. There's a war raging in Ukraine. Where the hordes of Russian aggressors move forward while the world appears to sit back and watch. Demonstrations abound. Passionate speeches in, 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 in various government buildings abound. Sanctions all over the world abound. 
posts on social media all over the planet from every person from young to old abound. And yet, we as a world society seem to be willing to sit back and let innocent people be butchered, let livelihoods be taken away, let homes be taken away, jobs be taken away, possessions be taken away. And that baby I saw, that toddler I saw, that they lost in the hospital from a bomb that fell. Ukraine has mandated that all men from the age of 19 to, or 18 to 60, stay behind and fight, and most of them want to do that. And while I applaud their sense of patriot duty, and I sense their sacrifice of national pride, we still sit all over the planet and watch this unfold on television, drinking some drink, hot or cold, feet up, sitting on a couch or a chair, or lying in bed. And watch from a distance as bad things happen to good people by an enemy. Who is the enemy in our lives today? I put it in the bulletin for you, very clear on the one side. Walt Kelly, his picture here, is the author of Pogo, a cartoon. And he said, we have met the enemy and he is us. We have met the enemy, and he is us. The first question is why. The second question is why do bad things happen to good people? And will this level of carnage that's happening in the Ukraine find its way into our lives because it gets under control because of a madman in Moscow? What can we do? Alexander... Isyavich Solzhenitsyn was a Russian novelist, one of the most famous Soviet dissidents. He was an outspoken critic of communism, helped to raise global awareness of the political repression in the Soviet Union, and in particular the gulag system that most people were locked in and died in. He offered this, and I want to read it to you verbatim. I don't want to get it wrong. Listen to these words from Alexander it's Yavish Solonitsyn. If only there were evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds and it were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. Let me read it one more time. If only there were evil deeds somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds, evil people, and it was necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them, but the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being, he says. And who is willing to destroy a piece of their own heart? Habakkuk, chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. The oracle, the vision that the prophet saw. How long, O Lord, will I call upon you for help? And you will not hear. I cry out to you, violence! Yet you do not save. Why do you make me see iniquity and cause me to look on wickedness? Yes, destruction and violence are before me. Strife exists and contention arises. Therefore the law is ignored and justice is never upheld. For the wicked surround the righteousness and therefore justice comes out perverted. And he brings to us questions, Habakkuk, from that first chapter. How long, Lord, will I cry out and there will be violence? Let me tell you what kind of violence is occurring or has occurred in Europe, in wars only. Just wars, just Europe. Just wars, just Europe. In the 17th century, 3.3 million people died in war, in Europe. In the 18th century, 5.2 million. In the 19th century, 5.8 million. And in the 19th or the 20th century, 28 million people were killed just in war, just in in Europe. How long I cry out violence. And then he goes on to say, why do you make me see iniquity? Why do you make me see evil? Why do you make me see all these things that are harmful? And, and, and why do the wicked surround the righteous? And why does 
just justice come out perverted. Why, Lord, all these things? Why? Well, the reason is, whether we like it or not, it's free choice. God has made it so that we have the choice to make good choices or bad choices. God does not want to see people suffer and die. There's no doubt about that. God does not want to see you suffer or die. But he allows it to happen in a free society. God sees our freedom as the ultimate of the greatest of good. That even though the good, the purposefulness, the the functionalness causes evil, it's good. Even though evil is caused, it's good. God sees it as good. He sees your freedom as good. And for God to take away evil and stop bad people in your life, in the lives, to stop whatever's happening in the Ukraine right now, God would have to make it possible if God was going to take evil and suffering and persecution and illness away from you he would have to rob you of your freedom he'd have to steal your freedom from you so God allows evil to have freedom? And if so, he allows your pain and suffering. So does God refuse to take away your pain and suffering? Yesterday, the day before, today, and tomorrow? Yes. Yes. God refuses to take away your suffering and your pain. But understand, there are miracles. I have seen miracles. I've seen people healed. I've seen things turned around. I've seen the natural order of things be suspended so that the phenomenal can happen and things start again. But that is not the norm today, is it? The norm today is that God will allow for most of us our pain and frustration to be visited upon us. God does not take away our pain and suffering, but listen... He enters into your pain. He enters into your suffering. He transforms your pain and your suffering. He, he redeems your pain and your suffering. Say to God, use my suffering, Lord. Use my suffering. Romans 8 and 28, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purposes, to His purposes. Excuse me. I want to read to you Numbers 11, verses 10 to 17. Numbers 11. And this is a conversation between God and between Moses. Numbers 11, verses 10 to 17. If God gives us free will, and if some of us choose with our free will to do good, and some of us choose with our free will to do evil, that's about the free will. And if we want to do what we want to do in life, when our children were small, we gave them some dolls one Christmas that had a string in the back. You pulled the string and it, you know, bum, 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 and talk to you. And one time it said, you know, oh, I love you. Give me a hug, right? Did the doll love them? No. No. The doll was a robot. It was mechanical. It said that it loved them, but they didn't love them. The doll was compelled 
to say that they loved them because the string was drawn on the back and the mechanism was set in motion. We have free will to decide who we love and who we don't love, to do evil or to do good. How are we going to handle this alone? How are we going to handle the fact that sometimes God allows bad things to happen to good people? How can we handle the fact that evil happens and God lets us suffer? God lets us be in pain because He believes that somewhere in that there is purposefulness. There is functionalness. There is good in that. This quick conversation between Moses and God. Verse 10 of chapter 11. Moses heard the people weeping throughout their families. Each man at the doorway of his tent, and the anger of the Lord was kindled greatly, and Moses was displeased. So Moses said to the Lord, Why have you been so hard on your servant? And why have I not found favor in your sight, that you have laid the burden of all these people on me? Was it you that I conceived all these people? No. Was it I who brought them forth, that you should say to me, Carry them in your bosom, like a nurse carries a, a nursing infant to the land which I swore to your fathers? Were I to get meat to give all these people for their weeping before me, saying, Give us meat that we might eat? I alone am not able to carry these people because it's too burdensome for me. And so if you're going to deal with us, with me, please kill me at once. I have found favor in your sight. Do not let me see wretchedness. And the Lord said before Moses, Gather for me seventy men from the elders of Israel, from whom you know to be elders of the people, and their officers, and bring them to the tent of meeting, and let them stand there with you. And I will come down and speak with you there, and I will take some of the spirit from you, and I will put it upon them, and they shall bear the burden of the people with you, so you won't have to do it alone. You don't have to live this life God's Spirit is in the people around you. And they can make the choice to love you or not. And I think that most of the people we know would make the choice to love us. But we have to understand, and they have to understand as well, that yes, bad things happen to good people. And good things come from pain and suffering. And that's the way it is. Before we go on from here, I want to watch a quick video. We're almost done. Please uh, watch this. It's right after, it's right the, uh, just before it as well. It should be blocked. Here we go. <laughs>
the pain shall be sighed. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound and the Lord shall be sin. Even so it is well with my